Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is your Nature Journal Workshop. And uh, we, today we're going to be doing um, a, a, a little bit of uh, kind of looking into some plant structure. We're also going to be looking at how, uh, what are some uh, strategies that you can use to get that structure onto your piece of paper. Today, let's talk botany. Now, botanists like botanical terms. This is a book. It's filled with botanical terms. It's a, um, it's a visual glossary of all the different botanical terms. And you can learn about the, uh, a, oh, this is fun. You can learn what a funiculus is, a funiculus, funiculus, funiculus. You can learn all about the funiculus here and when to say, drop terms like funiculus into your casual conversation. Um, and uh, so things like this puts the fun in funiculus. And, uh, but I don't want, um, this is not gonna be a vocabulary class. If you do not remember any of the terms um, that we're going to be looking at, you're still going to be okay. But it's really useful to notice what are the areas in which botanists have just geeked out on developing terms, because these are also the areas that, as a nature journaler, you want to pay close attention because those are areas where there is a lot of variation in plants. For some of these, um, it is useful to kind of get some of these terms under your belt. But do not feel pressure to memorize um, all the kind of inflorescence terms that we're going to be looking at today. Um, but if you get the general concept behind them, there's a few sort of big picture concepts, and you don't know the term, guess what? you're drawing a picture of it if you can show it that way. Otherwise, you would have to just a paragraph sort of saying like, well, there's this thing that kind of sticks out from the bottom of this thing that's kind of like this thing, I think, but you can just draw a picture of it. And so let, let me just kind of uh, you know, show you how this might look. Let's take a look at, here it is, the thrill cam, right? Um, So here is, here's a big botanical glossary. And the botanists have, you know, lots of terms for different shapes of how, let's zoom down on that a little bit. You know, uh, the sort of the structure of how flowers pop out of, of, of stems. They have all sorts of different terms for kind of looking at seed pods. These are all terms for how hairy a plant is. Is it papillate or is it granular? Um, or is it um, puberlent, puberlent, puberlent? Look at that puberlent flower over there. Um, but it sure isn't tomatose, all right? So these are, you know, if you are not a sketcher and you want to talk about how fuzzy a leaf is, then having this full vocabulary at your fingertips is great. And you can say, oh, it's tomatose. And everybody else will go like, all right, it's covered with little kind of woolly fuzz. But if you don't know the term, but you're a nature journaler, then what you can do is just kind of get out your little sketchbook and sort of say that, you know, the leaf is, is covered with fuzz and it's long and it's white. And you didn't have to memorize that term, but you can still communicate that same thing. You've got, here you're actually showing how long, how tomatose those that, uh, that, that flower is. Um, they also have terms for, where, where's that, uh, you know, the, the, I want to show you the shapes of, oh, here you go. Look at this. 
These are all terms for the overall shape of a leaf. Is it dentate or is it serrate? Is it crenulate? These are all tips for to terms for the, the shape of the tip of a leaf. And down here, we have um, a whole bunch of terms for the shape of the bottom of the leaf. Now, do you have to memorize this? You can, because then you can impress people at parties by saying, wow, look at that Hastate leaf over there, right? Um, but if you've forgotten those terms and you're out there sketching in the field and you draw something like this, you're golden. You've just communicate, communicated all that information. Um, still, sort of knowing that uh, botanists come up with lots of terms for all these different parts makes you sort of think about, you know, I should probably really pay attention to what the shape of the base of the leaf looks like. I had no idea that there was that much variation in it. Um, so it's, and sometimes they're, they're fun. Like, you know, the sagittate um, means arrow-shaped. And hastate means hastate. I have no clue what that means, right? Isn't that fun? But so you don't have to chordate. That makes sense. It's, it's heart-shaped. Chordate means heart-shaped. But for a lot of these, what I do is rather than for me to realize that I've got to, you know, uh, memorize all these different terms, I can, I can, I can draw, make a sketch of it. But that being said, I'm going to show you some terms and ideas and show how those relate with each other and fit together. And hold on just a moment. And the reason that I'm going to do this is that um, it's, it's useful to understand the system of how these, these terms are, are, are put together. And I'm also going to be pointing out some big picture ideas. So the tools which I'm going to be using today, I'm going to have a pad of paper and my pen. I'm going to um, also bring out a little watercolor kit just so I can color code a few things and my water brush. So those are going to be my, my tools of the day. We're going to start with flowers on a stalk. And what I, uh, before I really started thinking botanically, I would think to myself, all right, you know, I've got, <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at a plant and there's a, there's a flower that is kind of coming up here. There's a flower that's sort of at the tip of it. There's a plant with the flower on it. Um, and there's some other things coming off of uh, some other flowers on it. And sometimes for um, aesthetics or how I, or, you know, my, my, my sort of my patience, um, if there are a bunch of flowers on it. Um, I would say that there are other flowers, but I wouldn't really kind of pay, you know, as long as I kind of got the general shape of those flowers and where they popped out, um, I was, I was, I was happy. But what I was missing is that there actually are real patterns to how these flowers are attaching into the plant stem. And if I pay a little bit more attention there, I can get a lot more botanical information. Similarly with how the leaves are. Sometimes people notice a leaf and they'll look at the leaf on the plant and they'll kind of draw that one over there and then they'll just sort of put another one in. Oh, you know, might as well just sort of put it in here. But, whoops, sorry. But what my, but the, not just the shape of the, 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 the leaves, but but the, where they are coming out and how they're coming out of this stalk, of this stem, makes botanical difference. And different groups of plants will have their leaves 
organized and arranged in different sorts of ways. So one thing I want to look at is how are leaves arranged on stems and how are the flower clusters put together as well. So this is what we're going to call leaf arrangement down here. And this part here, the cluster of flowers, this is what botanists refer to as the inflorescence. So we're going to be looking at um, leaf arrangement and inflorescence, inflorescence and how those are put together. And I'm going to start um, fairly, fairly simply. And I'm going to imagine a plant here. There we go. Um, so I'm going to imagine a plant here, and my plant has a central stem thing coming up. And the flowers are then attached onto this. So um, I've got one flower that is attached on right here. I have another flower that is sort of a little bit around on the side, and it's attached back in here. There's another flower that is over on the side here. There's another flower that's pointing towards me here. There's another flower over here, kind of coming up, getting some smaller little buds of flowers, a little bud at the top. So I've got a central shaft with my flowers going up on it. Again, this is the inflorescence. The term stem um, we're going to not really use here because then you know people would talk about like the stem of the flower, the stem of the leaf, the stem of the big stalk. So when I say stem, it ends up being kind of a confusing term. So I'm going to call the stem that is down below the inflorescence, everything down there, that's the peduncle. <clears throat> and the stem part, once you kind of get into the flowers up to the top, that's called the rachis, or a C-H-I-S. So the botanist will make a distinction between um, the, there's the, the, the stem thing that is down below, there's the stem thing that's going up. Now, by the way, again, so you're, you might be thinking to yourself like, yeah, but do I really need to know that in order to draw the thing? No, you don't. No, you don't. But I'm going to be dropping some terms on you here, and um, I want you to absorb what is useful. And if you just sort of feel like you're getting into um, just too much of term land, then focus on the big ideas and ignore the um, ignore the those 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 little details. So very often on the 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 the, uh, ped, the, the ped, peduncles or peduncles the peduncle here um, that can be green. You often see on stems as they go up as we go up here into the rachis, that you will get um, kind of a color shift in them. So that's a fun thing to look for. Sometimes they're more sort of purpley towards the tip. Um, what you're seeing there in those more sort of purpley towards the tip is a plant pigment called anthocyanin that is sort of like sunscreen for the plant. So the plant doesn't get damaged by the sun. So do look for um, kind of color changes as you kind of go towards the, the top of a plant. On this plant, it has a bud at the top and it's going to continue to grow and make more flowers. And so on some plants, you're going to get big, you know, the big older flowers are at the bottom. And as you go up higher on that plant, you are getting um, younger and younger and younger plants. And on plants like that, you can continue to, to grow more plants, more flowers. There's another set way that plants can be set up. And that is where you have one central stalk, right, the peduncle. And on the top of that is their flower. 
And that's the first flower that comes out on the plant. And then it may subsequently make more flowers down here on the stalk. And so when that happens, all right, so I'm going to put a big flower here, a smaller one here, pop out here. Um, these sorts of plants, um, because you have kind of, you've got your cap here of your oldest flower, so we're going older than kind of going younger down to the bottom, this kind of a plant structure is not going to be able to continuously grow and make more different plants. There's sort of a limited number of ones that you can pop in here. So, um, it's useful to notice at the tip, are you getting your oldest here? Or you have the youngest at the tip. And ones where there's the oldest one at the tip, botanists have a special word for this. This is called a sign. C-Y-M-E. And so um, we are, so I, if I have my plants where the, the oldest is at the very end of the branch, I'm gonna be adding this sort of like a suffix at the, um, at the, the end. So I'll either call it a cymos structure um, or refer to it as a sign. Now what we're going to do is get into exactly how we're going to stick these different uh, flowers in the inflorescence into our plant. We're going to go back here. This one here where there's just sort of a central spike <clears throat> with flowers coming out directly from it. This one has the fancy botanical name of a spike. So a spike is just a peduncle attached, attached to a rachis. The flowers are coming directly out of that. If, however, I put little stems on each of these, I've now switched to a different inflorescence type. So let me put in my central axis here. I'm going to have my bud still at the tip. But this time, um, I have a stalk that is coming out. And there's my flower. And my next stalk is coming out. And there's my flower. And my next stalk. So there are little plant stems sticking out of that big stem. Or more specifically, there are pedicels sticking out of the rachis. So this, if there's a little stem that is below the, the, the plant here, that is called a pedicel. So P-E-D-I-C-E-L. So a pedicel is a little stem thing that attaches to the bottom of the flower. So the pedicel attaches to the flower. So if I have so I take the spike and I put all my flowers out on little pedicels, I have changed this to a new type. And this is what the botanists call a racine. And have my little flowers going up. But wait, there's more. <clears throat> you knew there would be, right? I'm now going to play with the length of these pedicels. I'm going to take exactly the same structure 
and watch what I can do with it. So here is my uh, peduncle sticking up and it's gonna go into the rachis. I can have a little bud here in the center. But this time I'm going to have stalks of different lengths on these that is going to allow all the flowers to come to the same height. So this one here is all the way out there. So it's on a really long pedestal. This one over here, not quite as long. This one over here. So what that will do is it'll put all the flowers at the same height and have the older ones at the outside edges. So olders at the outside edges and as you work your way in. This is got its own term. So again, if you're getting lost on the terms, just follow me on the basic arrangement of these sort of things and sort of see that there's a common plan here, but we're just changing the lengths of these different parts of this. Um, but this is a corm, C-O-R-Y-M. Should be ending like that, but we've got a silent B at the end of it. Why? Because we can. So I think that the sort of an easy way to think about this then is you're going to start with the spike and then you can push the flowers out on pedestals. You can then push those up all the way to the same height and they go from the raceme to the corm. Now let's take a, what we're going to do is we're going to take the, um, this raceme idea and we're going to kind of embellish that. So what if what if this time I have my central stock, so my peduncle going up into my rachis. If you could please lower just, ah, perfect, oh, thank, thank you. you. And I now I'm going to have a stock coming off here. It looks like I'm going to just sort of make this part of my drawing much like I did for my racine. But this time, each one of these little stalks that's sticking out, it's going to be its own raceme. So what I've got here is a raceme of racemes. Look at that, it's a raceme of racemes. This of course gets its own term, that's a panicle. So the panicle is a raceme of racemes. it ends up being really useful at the start of a drawing to look at um, what is the inflorescence structure. If you partway through a drawing um, discover that, oh, this is a panicle, um, 
then it's before you kind of have that insight, it'd be easy to sort of make a sort of put sort of leaves and plants or, or, or flowers kind of connecting in in sort of a random way that doesn't match the way that that specific plant is set up. So at the start of a drawing, taking some time to look at the inflorescence type is going to help you be able to draw that more accurately. If it's a panicle, maybe there's a suggestion of, yeah, this is a panicle in my drawing. And if I'm just sort of making it out up, kind of adding some flowers in and kind of taking out others, I, I might lose a bunch of this structure. So when I was working on my, my field guide of the Sierra, let me go grab a copy. Um, what I would do is I would, ooh, let's spike. Um, I would first look at what the inflorescence type was. And so, because I would want to get that captured in my sketch. If it's set up like this, that's going to be a really different plant than one that is set up like this. when I was out there in the field, I would forget the names of all those different terms. And that didn't matter. And because what I was still doing is I was looking at, all right, what kind of, what is going on with this inflorescence? Oh, this is, there's one central shaft and the flowers are tucking directly into that. That's going to be different than if I am looking at a, um, a, 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 a plant where those are with, with a different sort of arrangement. So I want to, to see the inflorescence type before my drawing is done. Now, um, <clears throat> let's just add in a little bit more. Um, and actually, what... Um, I am, there's actually, I probably should have done this back in, can we jump back to our quorum notes? Because <laughs> I'm going to take quorum and I'm going to take this idea here and apply it to a quorum. So here we had a raceme of racemes. Um, I can also have a compound quorum. And so I can get, so my basic structure is going to be, I'm going to have all my plants coming to, my, all my flowers coming to a common height. I have my central axis of my plant down here. But uh, what if I had my plant Here. Oh, just there we go. There we are. Um, I'm going to make a, um, a hang a whole bunch of corms um, on top of this plant. This is now a compound corm. here. And so this, and here I'm drawing these as if they're all ironed flat. In life, these are going to be three-dimensional structures, and we'll kind of get to the, a little bit of that three-dimensional nature of them. But, but for making kind of a quick diagram in your notes here, compound, Um, it's helpful just sort of think of these things as, as, as flattened. There is two, there are two other kind of arrangements that I want to point out 
um, that we can look for. And one of them is called the umbel. So if there is a central point, and from that, all the flowers connect, usually as you get towards the middle, younger flowers, so older on the outside, getting younger towards the inside. This is called an umbel. And just as we could have a raceme of racemes and call it a panicle, um, and we did the same thing with the corm, right? We made that into a compound corm. Think for a moment what a compound umbel would look like. An umbel of umbels. Right? Uh, so there's little Uriah heap. I'm going to first come from each of these points, come out. And then from each one of those, there is going to be a little umble popping out there. So here is a compound umble, the umble of umbles. So <clears throat> we've seen a whole selection of these. There's one, I guess there's one other little arrangement that you will sometimes bump into. And it's not so much a different category of its own, but it's another, it's a, it's a prefix that you can get with one of these uh, arrangements. So let's, I'm actually I'm gonna go all the way back to uh, the Racine here. If I take my raceme and what I do is I come up and I have my first flower come out and then my, um, my rachis continues from there. So I've gone from being the peduncle into the rachis, but my next flower a little bit younger is gonna come out on the same side, right? So instead of being on the opposite side, and then the next one, a little bit younger, pops out on the same side, and the next one pops out on the same side to the bud. I can get these lovely curling arrangements. And so this, when they're sort of doing this curling thing, um, that can be, uh, that is called being scorpioid, like the tail of a scorpion. So I can have a scorpioid, scorpioid raceme here. I can, if it is this way, with the oldest flower out here at the tip and younger ones coming back, then that is a scorpioid sign. But so just think when these are all kind of in a scorpion hook, um, that's the term, well, we can also use the term scorpioid. To describe that. So there's a, again, botanists have lots of terms. Um, if this feels like way too many terms, then 
you should check out mycology. <laughs> Mycologists um, did not want to be outdone by botanists and so tried to come up with more little micro terms for describing you know textures and things than even the botanists had. Um, but um, you don't have to remember like it, it uh, what, what I find is I'll study this stuff and then kind of get it straight in my head like okay this is a cyme and this is a panicle and this is a raceme and this is a corm and then what will happen is a little bit of time goes by and I forget the terms but I still remember like okay they can come out like boop, 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 out the stem right boop, 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 boop. and then those stems can be attached to another even bigger stem so even without the terms I still have those basic ideas and you can still completely effectively analyze your plant for your purposes of um, documenting it in your journal if you forget all those terms. You're going to be OK. But it is useful just to notice that we have all these terms because these inflorescences, inflorescences are different. And if that then prompts me to look a little bit more carefully, then I have helped myself be able to draw what I see. Now let's take a look at the leaves. And on the leaves, there are a couple of um, different arrangements of the leaves that I want to have in my head. There are three big categories and then we'll kind of mess with those. And the first is let's actually kind of define what a leaf is. Um, if this is my plant stem and there is a little bud here, plants will have buds on, on them. The structure that sticks off right underneath the bud is a leaf. Why is this kind of bud significant? Because what a lot of people say is that anything that kind of looks like this green thing here, that's a leaf. So if that's a leaf for you, um, you're going to get confused by the compound leaves. And the compound leaf is that some leaves have this arrangement where they um, branch off and they have these different parts that look like leaves. So is this a leaf and this a leaf and this a leaf? What the botanists are saying a leaf is, is you're going to follow the whole structure down till where you find a bud. And then everything from the bud out from that is a leaf. So even on this thing here with these three parts where each one of those looks like a leaf, they're going to call those leaflets and the whole structure the leaf. So those are three leaflets on one leaf, just like you find on poison oak. Poison oak doesn't have three leaves. It has lots of leaves, depending on the side of the, 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 the bush, but it has three leaflets. And then if you look right down there where the, 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 the stem of the leaf meets the stem of the plant, there's a little bud right there. And now you see what just happened. I had the stem of the leaf meeting the stem of the plant. So we've got to come up with a better term for it. So on a leaf stem, the stem of a leaf, the term that a botanist use for that is a petiole. So as opposed to a pedicel on the flower. So pedicel on the flower, pedicel, pedicel, and petiole on a leaf. Are you going to be okay if you don't remember that term? Yeah, you'll be just fine. There are a few botanists out there where if you call the um, petiole a stem, the leaf stem, they get cranky. But um, 
you know, that's just because they didn't get enough hugs. So if anybody ever does that to you and says like, excuse me, but that's a petiole, give them a hug. Um, so let's now put these leaves onto our plant. And a couple of ways that you can do this. So here is my plant. I can have a leaf coming out here and another leaf coming out here. All right. Um, and my next leaf coming out here and my next leaf coming out here. This arrangement of leaves is called alternate because they alternate one side, another side, another side, another side. Um, you will also often have these slowly moving around in a spiral and we'll kind of get to that. But these aren't always in the same flat plane. Another way of doing this, of arranging these, is having one leaf here and directly opposite it, the next leaf comes out. That, you guessed it, is called opposite. So the leaves can be opposite or alternate. Sometimes with this, these opposite leaves, there's a fun arrangement um, that you'll get um, where either they're rank, they're organized with two that are kind of, you know, in there, there's sort of all in the same plane here, or sometimes I'm going to now draw this little three dimensional diagram. So here is, I'm going to make this stem square for convenience here. And you'll see in a moment for another reason, imagine that this is my stem. And I had one leaf that attached here and the other leaf attached on the opposite side of that. But then the next one came out on this surface. And its partner leaf came in over there. And then the next one on up went back to this side. So they're opposite leaves, but they're going this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction. All right. These ones are called four ranked. And these ones two ranked. But again, we don't need to, to, to memorize those terms. Um, this four ranked arrangement is what you see in the mint family. So you'll see these opposite leaves coming out but first one will be this way, then the next one this way, and then this way, and then this way. Um, I, when I got started drawing plants, I would just sort of randomly, I would look at the shape of the leaf and kind of put one in and then put another leaf in and not really pay attention to how they were doing it. Now what I do kind of knowing that plants are kind of particular about how they set this up, I will, now really look at the plant and I look like, oh, there is another leaf that's going in there. And I'll put in the leaves and the direction that they're kind of coming out. One last leaf arrangement, draw an oval lightly and bring that down to a cone here. And then put a stem through the middle of it. So I've got a cone with a central post through the middle of it. The leaves can all be attached here. Remember in the umbel where they all had this common attachment? Let's do that same sort of a thing, but with leaves. We're gonna attach them all here. So this one is going to come out here and this one here, and another one back here, another one over here. Leaves that are arranged like this are called 
world. So these are world leaves. And that's spelled with a W. <clears throat> W-H-O-R-L-E-D. So here are my world leaves. And they're in a whirl around that plant stem. Now, I want to show you something utterly mind-blowing and beautiful. So if you had the patience to kind of stick through all of these terms, here is your reward. I actually think this stuff is neat. I like kind of thinking about diagrams of these, these, these structures. Look at this. Just got this guy out of my garden. And very often we look at this and you kind of go like, well, there's no pattern here. These things are just kind of, they're okay, that's opposite. So I've got this node here with leaves coming out, the next one here, the next one here, next one here. And they're just kind of coming out um, um, alternately here. Um, and yeah, this one is over here on this side. This one is over here on this side. But look at this one back here. This one here, this little cluster of leaves here from this bud, there's a leaf and the bud is, is bursting out, giving you more leaves. Actually, that's I should point that out. So what's going on here is here's a leaf. And the bud that was at the base of that leaf has now sent out this little branch. It was just a bud before, but now it is a branch with new leaves on it. But this was, so here's one here. This one's coming out this way. This one's coming out this way. This one here is coming out. I'm gonna, hold on, I'm going to turn it so you can see it. This one here is pointing away from you. So if I, um, you know, so here's the stalk. This one, see how it's pointing away from you? It's on the side that's away from you. So these are pointing in different directions. This one out this way, this one out this way, this one out that way. Huh, that's interesting. But look at this. If I start here, this one is pointing out this direction. This next leaf that is this leaf up here is pointing out in the same direction that this one is. So this one is kind of pointing out here. And this one up here is pointing out the same way. Now, watch this. I'm going to start here at this little cluster, this, this leaf position here. And I want you to think of these not just as randomly coming out in different directions, but as actually being arranged in a spiral. So as I go from this one, the next one up is here. And the shortest distance between this one and this one is for me to go around this way. So this is spiraling in this direction. This one is spiraling as I look at it from the bottom counterclockwise. If I were to look at it from the top clockwise. So this position, then up to this position, then up to this position, then back up to this position again. Now, so one, two, I'm going to do a little bit of counting. So I'm going to call this position one. When I get back up to that same position up here, I'm going to call it position one again. And so I'm going to come from here, from position one to position two, spiraling then around the other side to position 
three here. And then we are back to that same position that we had here. So there are three different positions that I see the leaves sticking out. I'll call this one, this is two, this is three. And then I'm seeing that same position again. And it spiraled around one time to get from here back up to here. So it spiraled, it crossed over here one time back to this position. Now, this seems like um, kind of uh, sort of like, oh yeah, things are pointing out different directions and then you can get the same position repeating. But notice that it spiraled around one time and it was three positions. So just hold those numbers in your head for a second. Because here is the crazy thing. And you get to do this in your own garden in just a moment. So here is a big old scraggly plant from my garden. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, I'm going to call this leaf here position one. And as I go up on this, I want to find where is the next one that is in exactly this same position along the stem here. So is it this one? No, that one's pointing off to the side. This one's pointing off that way. This one here is pointing off like that. This one here is pointing off in a different direction. Um, not this one here. Oh, all the way up here. So I go from, from here, I go all the way up to here and I find one that is this, the direction that this one is coming out is the same the direction as this one. People see what I'm doing so far? I'm just going up on the stem here. Where is the next one that is in that same position? And by position, I mean, imagine it like a clock. What o'clock would that leaf be emerging? Now, we're going to blow your mind. I'm going to count how many positions there are between, uh, how many leaves there are between this position until I get to that position again right up here. Are you ready? I'm going to call this one position one. And when I get back up to this one, I'm not going to recount this leaf up here. So I'm only going to count that position one time. But here's how many positions. One, then I'm swinging around to the back side here for two, over here to three, then up here to four, then away from you, there's one back here that is five, six, seven. I'm coming, swinging around toward the back here. Here's eight. And then I'm back up here to this position again. So there were eight positions eight of the leaves were sticking out between this one and this one. And let's look at how many times I circle around to get back up to that same position. Watch this. So just, and, and this, by the way, what I'm doing right now, not necessary to draw this plant, not necessary to draw this plant, but exquisitely cool when you sort of see there's a pattern that's going to emerge here that's going to make you say, I really want to pay attention to what direction on the stem these leaves are checking out. So take the, take a look at this. So here's position number nine. I'm sorry, sorry, position number one. And there were nine, I'm sorry, eight different positions. And let's see how many times I have to kind of wrap around this to get back up to that position. So from here, wrapping around to two, three. So I'm now crossing over this plane again. That is one time around. So I've gone from here over to this, then up to this step, then around once. Now we're swinging around behind again. And we're crossing it over a second time over to this position. Then there's another leaf that is down here behind here. And we're crossing, coming around a third time. So this twisted around three times to get from this position to this position. And you're thinking, well, 
do I need to know this in order to draw this plan? No, no, you don't. But but still, hang on, and you'll see why I'm geeking out on this because this is about to get ferociously, ferociously cool because it goes back to our friend Fibonacci. And Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician who loved bunnies and solved a a math problem about bunny reproduction and in so doing came up with this sequence of numbers. The question started with if you had two bunnies and if they were to make and they only made one more bunny, um, the one and the one would then make, you would have, um, so one and one is two. Now I'm gonna take these two, the one and the two, and I'm gonna put those together. So one plus two equals, Now I'm going to take the three and the two. I'm going to add those together and I get this. And now I'm going to take the five and the three and I'm put them together and I'm going to get this. And then lastly, we could go further, the eight and the five, I would get 13. And you can see how you can keep going with this sequence. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. It shows up everywhere in nature. Um, but in what we've just seen, let's take this plant. Anybody remember how many positions there were to get from one leaf position back to um, that same position again? There were eight positions. And how many times did it spiral around to get from here to there? Three. That eight and the three. What about this one? There were three leaf positions. And how many times did it spiral around? It spiraled around once. And here's the crazy thing. On all the plants in your garden, if you start going out there and you find one plant, uh, one leaf position, and you find the next one above it, that the number of leaf positions will be a number on the Fibonacci sequence. And what gets more crazy, the number of times that it spirals around to get back to that position will be a number on the Fibonacci sequence two positions lower than the number of um, than the number of leaf positions. So the three, what is two positions lower? Boop, boop, that was a one. What was the eight? What is two positions lower? Boop, boop, that's a three. There is mathematical formulas embedded in this plant. And we look at it and you just go, like, oh, they're just sort of randomly kind of coming out wherever there's space. No, there's a system here. And that system then allows these things to be spaced out in a way so that they will, the leaves will compete the least amount with each other um, for that arrangement type. And it is, it is so Cool. So I just wanted to share that with you. Do you need to know this in order to draw it? No, because you're just looking at the plant and I'm gonna put in the next leaf, I'm gonna put in the next leaf. But I am saying, yeah, pay attention to this one that is coming out here and this coming, the one that's coming out here. And sometimes what I used to do is I don't like that leaf. I'm just gonna leave that leaf out because you know they're just kind of leaves in there. I, but no, there's, if you are really kind of getting into these things, then I might suggest honoring the positioning of those leaves. And oh my gosh, the tip is covered with aphids. Oh, don't know if you can see, let's see if we can get this in focus. There are aphids all over there. Look at them go. They're going, oh my gosh, there's a giant holding our plant. Ah! Don't worry y'all, I will get you and your friends back out into the field, including you, sorry to make you fall off. So I'm now doing aphid rescue on my plant here. 
Um, so, but isn't that sequence cool? I mean, look at this, it, like just um, a, a, a kind of similar idea. These, anything that is in spirals in nature, when you see spirals in nature, Fibonacci is not going to be too far behind. Fibonacci is not going to be too far behind. Um, so on these ones, there are these, there are these rows. See those rows going this way and rows going this way. Um, I mean, you can call those whatever you want, but they would still smell just as sweet. Um, but here's the, so I'm going to take this row, these rows here, this one, I'm going to call row number one. Right. And if I count the number of rows going around here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rows to get back to that one. What do you know? The number of rows in going around in one direction on this pine cone, there were eight rows. You want to know what would happen if I count them going the other direction because it's at a slightly different angle. You get more. There are 13. I already counted it on this one. Oh! See, that's just cool. Um, so when you're getting into looking at these inflorescence patterns, and there's the, the, the plants have a system. So the best thing to do is to pay attention to the, hold on a second, get back to this. So believe the plant. It's saying, I've got a leaf coming out here. I'm going to put a leaf coming out here. I've got a leaf coming out here. I'm going to put a leaf coming out here. And if you're wondering like, yeah, but then now I've got these four shortened leaves and this one's pointing this way, this one's pointing this way. Remember that was in that botanical illustration series. Um, we started with that, right? So we were drawing those in all those different four shortened positions. So I would go back and recheck that one. And then when you're getting into the stem of the plant, instead of like, yeah, here's the stem, there's some leaves, you'll be going like, ooh, there are like, okay, what is like, this one's coming out this angle, this one's coming out this angle, and that one's coming back out at the same place, ah, right? And so you're now, <laughs> the, uh, you are now able to, to see this underlying math inside the stem of the plant where before you're just like, oh yeah, there's some leaves in here. I'm going to put that one in. Maybe I'll leave that one out, right? But once you get into Fibonacci, you'll be like, oh, I don't want to leave that one out because then I'll mess up my pattern and I can get this pattern in my journal and it'll be really fun. So here it out. It's just sort of more playing with, playing with the fib. Oh. It's, it's fun. It's really, really fun. Um, well, there we have it, folks. Um, a few take homes here. The names don't matter. The names are useful. And if you know the names, that's great. I'm not saying don't get those names down. But if you forget the names, but you remember the general patterns that we're talking about here, then then you're in good shape. And the, the pattern on the plant, you know, you, there, there's no, there's no, there's no one, uh, I completely lost my train of thought, but <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the positions of the leaves matters to the plant. And so I really recommend for people, you know, pay attention to that. And when you realize that there's something, when you start doing this sort of Fibonacci counting on your plants, let me really get out there, look around your own garden and, or, or a park that's near you and go like, let's see this one. And um, you know, you'll find a lot of three ones, like here's another three one, here's another three one. And then you'll realize like, oh no, this one, this one is gonna be, this one is gonna be a bigger one. And then it, it's, good, it's exciting. It's a little scavenger hunt that you can have for all these things. Um, have fun with that. And remember, it, it makes a difference to those plants. What we're going to do now is I'm going to remove my spotlight. We are going to make it possible for you and your friends to unmute yourselves. And 
Um, we're going to go to our gallery view here and see what folks are up to. Let's first check in with, um, I see um, Falters, you've got a journal up there. Ray Bonto also has a journal entry to share. Um, Walters, we're going to start with you, then we'll jump over to London. Anybody else that wants to share things? Um, Heidi's going to have something to, cool to show us in, uh, after that. So we'll go um, Walters, Ray Bonto, Heidi, and then we'll also bounce around to anybody else. Hey there. Hi. Yeah. So um, yesterday, yesterday in the morning, I was uh, out exercise. I wasn't out, but I was exercising in my room, and I heard this uh, this uh, bang on my window, and it, I don't remember the English name of it, but it's a warbler of a kind, and I kind of, and it was uh, it was pretty dizzy, so I picked it up, and my my hand didn't work out very well, but you kind of you get the sense that you're holding it, so. Mm, happy about yeah. these drawings. Oh, and and you you're able then to really get in on those the the patterns there around the eye and the face, which on those warblers mm. is just so crit critical for their expression. This really yeah. feels uh, warblery. And by the way, so warblers um, in Europe they're talking about a different group of birds than um, the wood warblers, which we think of as warblers here in the United States. So. Um, similar general body type, but um, a, a different group. Also, I love that that you've got that that suture up the middle of the chest where the, the, the breast feathers come together. Yeah, yeah, it was very distinctive uh, in the bird. You could see it very, uh, very well. Oh, I found the warbler. It's a sedge warbler. So maybe I didn't get the patterns very right, but this is a sedge warbler. All right. Yeah. Okay. Those, those, those. There's a, a several warblers, like sedge warblers, reed warblers. You've got all this, these, these ones that um, I cannot tell apart to save. We my life. have a lot of warblers here. You just get these. All of these are yeah. so. And and over there, the, your warblers. They're, they're they're often sort of they're this. It's a brown bird with an eye stripe, and then you compare it with the other brown bird yeah. with the eye stripe. And then yeah, there's another have, one that's bird have, and like, it's brown and it has a stripe by its eye. Yeah, well, I at first I uh, I when it hit my window and I look, I kind of looked at it. I thought of three possibilities, but then I kind of eliminated to two, and this one came in. Right. Uh, there was aquatic warbler, is also pretty similar, but that's very rare, and it has more stripes on top of its head. And then there was. Uh, grasshopper warbler, if I'm not mistaken, but that has a bigger tail. So yeah, they're all brown and pretty similar. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fun challenge. I, yeah. uh, I'm really liking the, the, the way that the, the wing is simplified on the bird on the right there. So just a very um, simple shape. And I also like how you're approaching this from all these different angles. You have, um, Front view and side view. Everybody check this out. Notice how Vultures has drawn the, the bird where the body is side is looking towards you. And then the one where the, the body is pointing towards you, the bird's head is to the side. It just makes these so much more kind of lively and dynamic. You kind of get the feeling that these birds are moving around and yeah. uh, doing I, their bird. I didn't want to keep it for too long because it, it, uh, it was kind of, uh, you know, dizzy still. And it couldn't fly, but I didn't want to keep it around for long. You know, he started, he started to get more lively, started flapping a bit, and then I just had to let him loose. You know, not to make him uh, suffer or anything. Yeah. That's so, right. well, a good thing. Yeah, but save, that saved bird. him from a cat. Saved him from a cat. There was a touch. <laughs> I came outside, and the cat was like literally grabbing him. So. Oh, yeah. good, 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 good. The um. And also notice that uh, Vultures is using the birder's grip, um, and so uh, or bander's grip, I should say. So people who are ringers um, or have, have experience with uh, birds in the hand will hold them in ways where you don't accidentally break their legs. And mm. so yeah, you kind of you kind of hold it, and the 
and then their legs go, it's hard to explain, but through the fingers and you kind of, yeah, their legs stick out and yeah, it's a very safe way you have to take all the way to their legs because if you take them kind of loosely, they can start like kind of jumping and flapping and that can hurt their legs. So very at the base of the legs. We had, a, I had, I had, when I was start, start first, the uh, first time when I started ringing, I had a whole day where they taught me how to uh, hold a bird correctly. It's uh, important. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I also didn't have time to sketch them, but uh, red back shrikes have come, came here. Uh, they nested in front of my house last year. And today I saw a female and a male. They were uh, catching some lizards and grasshoppers. And uh, so maybe tomorrow we'll be able to journal them. Uh, oh, really wow. fun to see those guys again. Wow. Um, I said the, the Keith Brokey book has a nice uh, drawing that he did of uh, the red back shrike that uh, yeah. is in the hand. And he's got some notes about how it bit his finger. And uh, drew blood. I think it wasn't. A, I think that one wasn't a red back shrike. Oh, that was. That was a, yeah, that was a great gray shrike. I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I remember it has done. Uh, Return to one. Man's Island. Yeah. That was also in the book. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, thank you. So, and folks, remember that. So we had that bird from several different angles. Um, we also have a, a bird here saved from the cat. Um, cats are have uh, domestic cats, which we keep in large populations around our urban areas by supplementing their their diet. Where we human beings maintain a um, a large an unnaturally large population of what are called meso predators, sort of medium sized predators, um, and even our, when our house cats. Um, are fed, well fed, it's still they're kind of, you know, hey, I'm a cat, this is what I do. Um, they still will get out there and kill birds, even if it's got a tummy that's full. Um, yeah. So we can actually make a big uh, difference for bird populations by keeping our cats indoors. Um, yeah, well, to I, people to have indoor it, cats. Yeah, it was, it was a cat that I've seen here a lot before but usually you know when I come outside it's scared of me and then he was I, I like came in front of him between the bird and him and he was still going after the bird he was trying to sneak he usually gets scared and runs away but he was uh very determined to get the bird so yeah, yeah. that predator brain kind of clicked in like I'm gonna get me some of that mm -hmm. well thank you so much for sharing that really fun to thank see thank you that. I mean, it was your birthday. Okay. okay. Oh, Hello. that's right. Happy birthday, Arpan. <laughs> oh, thank you. Not today. I know. Yesterday. We, we, we missed it. <laughs> uh, belatedly. Fine. Oh, look at what's going on here. So, did you enjoy kind of the, the, the look into the structure? Yeah. I don't have much of an interest in botany, anatomy exactly, but I'm, if I do, I make illustrations for them. I like the class. Yeah, it's, it's a slippery slope. You know, you start with pigeons and birds, and at some point you'll be like, oh, check out this cool plant over here. Well, you, you've already got some, some cool drawings of, of, of some plants. So, so tell us about what you've been up to in your journal. So uh, um, this is my practice. Nothing else. Um, <laughs> and um, so this, well, uh, this is the quorum, uh, mm -hmm. or yeah. And I just listed every, uh, I just drew everything you drew and copied it, even if I didn't understand. A good uh, thing to do sometimes is when you're looking at a real plant is just make yourself a simplified diagram of what am I seeing with these. Uh, sometimes when you're not having to worry about drawing a flower, you're just going to put a ball on the end of a stalk. 
um, that will help you be able to kind of see and map out and think about the inflorescence. This is great, Ribanto. Thank you. A giant um, sequence. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. This is cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, this is really fun. So um, what uh, Rebanto has got going on here is um, notice that there's uh, two boxes in the center, starting one box, one box. And then the side of that equals two boxes. Then the side of the next box is the one box plus the two boxes. That's the three. Then you have the two boxes plus the three boxes. That's the five. And then by putting all these boxes together in this arrangement, it makes a uh, expanding helix. Um, so this is this is a this is a really cool Fibonacci spiral that you've created here. <laughs> My dad's birthday gift. I uh, drew um, a Western Marsh Harrier. Oh. On eight. Wow. Um, Ray Bonto, this is, this is next level stuff for you. You have, um, you're, you're really, your, your facility with understanding the, the paint, understanding, um, the structure and anatomy of the birds, it's all coming together. This, I can feel the texture of this. I see the scapular feathers in there. I can see all the different regions of the, 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 the feathers, the secondaries, the primaries. There's my allula. Um, the anatomy of this bird is really, really exciting. And also just um, the, the, and the back I'm sorry, uh, yes? The background. And detail in the feather things, the background, the detail, the stripes and stuff, two, 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 and 35. Oh, <laughs> that's great. You're, you're having fun with those? Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, I opened the parcel and there I got the N89, but the N95 fell out and into my wardrobe and I yeah, it got lost somewhere, and in the morning I found it. <laughs> oh. so. You spent the night floating around in water? That again? Yeah, it, it's neat. Sorry, say that again? Yeah, you, you, you have this, um, with those tombos, you're able to, it's this combination, sort of, your brain is sort of in painting mode, and part of it is also in, um, in, uh, you know, looking at the, um, so your, 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 your brain is also drawing and it's neat to have those two kind of come together. Really useful uh, tool. My, fav my favorites are the N75. I haven't got it here because it ran out, but um, N35, um, N89 and N95. There you are. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Arpan, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, your birthday present here? Yeah. Yeah, I got it kind of um, really late at night. <clears throat> and because after... it's a surprise. He gave my birthday present late in the night. <laughs> so, yeah, I was totally overblown by it. So, and the only thing is he folded the paper in really so many times. I thought, why did you fold it so many times? He just just in order to hide it under the sofa <laughs> you have to make it really really small <laughs> it's fine now it's um uh, it's one of those a2 papers that he recently brought in so yeah uh, i think it was non-special thank you um this this is such a a, a special piece yes absolutely thanks Arpan, thank you so much for your support of Ray Bonto's uh, developing passions and interests with, with birds, with, with art, with nature observation. Um, it's wonderful to see what happens with 
a, a mind that is given permission and the time to to to, to <clears throat> run with what is what's important. And thank you, thank you. And so, um, um, this wasn't my nature. This was my nature journal page, and so. Um, this was um, a new breed. I mean, not new, but I really see it. Um, this bit that's plain was about white. Um, the bits that I haven't colored with value. Mm -hmm. And um, what is it? Pigeon. It's pigeon, of course. What else? And so. Uh, um, <laughs> Okay. And then uh, this was another ragged pigeon. I mean, it not ragged, but it looked rather rough. Like it had, it was dry. It looked starved. Yeah, it looked starved to death. Oh dear. <laughs> um, um, it looked like it, but I did. I had a doubt because food is all around the park. Um. Um, so, I don't know. And pigeons do eat um, stuff, like stuff from restaurants dropped on the road, so it probably can't be starved. But I don't know what happened. This is a big portrait of it. Oh. Okay, look at how you're kind of, you're, you're noticing the planes there. Um, I really feel that this has structure to it. It has volume. Um, and you are, you're kind of sort of noticing sort of where the, the angles of the surface of this bird change. That is, um, you know, I, I feel like I, I can hold that in my hands because of the way you've just defined those planes. That's really exciting to see. And the final pigeon, um, this was very light. And so I just, with my lead holder. Oh. Yeah, there's so much to learn from the, the birds. The birds that are around us all the time, we don't take advantage of them. Most of us don't. Um, but if you kind of really cut your teeth on these, um, these, these familiar cooperative birds, um, you're ready for anything that will come across your path. Just the, the subtleties of the, um, of the breast of this bird, where it kind of tucks in below the, the, the upper chest there. Um, just wonderful, wonderful observations. I've seen that on birds, and you've captured that with your line. So um, it was, they were at a distance, um, like over nine, eight meters away, six, eight meters like very far and they were smaller than the drawing. So how do I get the detail? Well, that. <laughs> it's fun how those birds, the, the scope really puts the bird in your lap, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it's really fun. Um, so yes, and my, I don't know if I wanna take up anyone else's time, but my un incomplete relativity, I told you on Tuesday. Um, yeah, uh, this, I didn't do the sketch like yet, but um, okay. I told you about the bouncing universe getting sucked up by a surviving black hole. Now there's an antidote to that, uh, oh. to black hole disease. Oh, I, I'm um, because it would be good to have that strategy should we kind of run into the problem of the bouncing black hole. We got to know how we are going to handle this. Let's give us the, the antidote to black hole disease. This sounds quite fun. Okay, so. Oh, sorry. Um, so, um, um, oddly, the prescription is a big rip, not big crunch. Now, phantom energy uh, will go up immediately and rip everything apart, but it will disturb other material, uh, which will turn it negative, turning it, it 
and it'll uh, completely rip up black holes and then uh, it'll turn it'll disturb something else which in turn will turn phantom energy negative which will turn it back into a big crunch without any black hole disease i think i'm going to need you to give me a um, sketch note diagram of that um, for our next call um, i would love to to see that diagrammed out uh, yeah that was um nearly it and then um now it might slow down uh the, it'll just bounce and bounce and bounce and eventually it'll just slow down and run out of steam and stop um okay yeah that is but um, it's not i explained all that well and um okay so what if none of this happened what if dark energy stays the same way well the universe still will end um because everything does come to an end whatever happens um so um first okay there's um, google's have tons of hydrogen in the universe and hydrogen is used to make stars yes um stars make uh, well in the process of making stars planets are also made in turn life might be made so you can say without stars there's nothing um um i, I, so, I love carl sagan's expression yeah. uh quite literally that we are all made of stardust um that the yeah. <laughs> complex atoms that we're seeing around us are the results of explosions inside ancient ancient dying stars that then get scattered throughout the universe and that's why we're having this conversation <laughs> And so, so in, in a few, in a trillion years, um, all that hydrogen will be used up. And so no more stars and the last star dies. And then the now black dwarfs, the remnants of sun-like stars or dwarf stars, the cosmic diamonds, you can say, um, um, there'll be so many black holes that they'll just fall in. Black holes will collide, make gigantic thousands of light years black holes. And then neutron stars will wear out. Then um, stellar mass black holes will wear out in about... I don't know how to call this number, but I can say it by the power of, so 10 to the power of 83 years. Um, so unimaginably long. <laughs> um, and then, um, then supermassive black holes will also decay. And then atoms will split apart and the universe will be nothing but a sea of low, fo uh, low power photons and few broken atoms uh, in a Google years, which is one followed by a hundred zeros. So we, we shouldn't be kind of holding our breath waiting for that. But just it is just sort of another wonderful thing to think about that we have the opportunity to be alive and sentient during this kind of portion of the history of the universe where it's possible to do that. Thank you so much, Ray Bonto. Thank you. It's Thank really you. good to see you. I'm, I'm now going to jump over to Heidi and then to Ivea. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. It's going to be hard to, to do what he has been doing. So, but it's this is a, uh, I don't know what it is. And, and I made this. Uh, I'm going to see uh, and talk to the person who gave it to me because I was doing, I thought that this was the most amazing um, uh, thing that I've ever had in, in, in this. So um, on this, this you can also see that just the difference in the structure between the, the pistol and the stamen there, that branching curled back pistol yeah. Uh, the stigma of that is so cool. Yeah, it's um, 
it's right down in here. And there's, um, I don't know if you could see it, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to take a look and uh, my friend gave it to me and she, uh, uh, she said here and she got the same one, but I'm taking it very carefully and I will tell you what it, I don't know what it is. I don't know. I, I don't know either. Yeah. So I'll let you know next week. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. this is this is amazing, and I'm gonna try to structure and things are, you know, there's just also that just the velvet of the 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 people texture there. Yeah, yeah. And, and this this whole thing, this whole thing. Yes. And down here, I I've, it's like. It just, <laughs> I, I, I really had a, a funny time with her. She's, so I said I, I'd find out what it was. Oh, that's fine. Thank, Thank you so much for sharing that. Could we see the, the journal notes that you took again? I don't, I, I did this one. I was, I was doing this listening to you. Yeah, that's, yeah, this is what I wanted to check out. Yeah, so yeah. it'll be, it'll, I have to keep going. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really fun. How interesting the asymmetry in those um, those those curling tuples are. That's, Sorry, it, it's interesting to see the asymmetry, the different yes. the different widths of all of them. And uh, it's been a a day since I've had it, um, so we'll see what happens, and and I'll and I'll make this better, too. And I was, uh, but you, you, for some reason, you were doing today what I should have been looking at, but I just was going with this thing as you were, were doing it. Thank well, you. well, sometimes, you know, I, I think that, you know, just it, the, there is no thing that you should be doing, but, but I would say you should be just sort of following with whatever in that moment is making your heart feel excited. And I see why it was pulled to that plan. Okay, thank you. I'll see you next week. Great, I will, I will see you again soon. Okay, bye everybody. <laughs> thank you, Heidi. So I'm gonna to jump to Vea and then over to Jeff. What? Oh, there you go, yes. Hello. Um, so I just have my breakfast, my, my, no, my, 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 um, lunch. lunch. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. So, yeah, this, um, I don't know that this is necessarily very special, but I just wanted people to know um, this, okay, first of all, this class was so much fun. If anybody like else is addicted to plants, like that, this was just so much fun. Um, but also just to, a, a reminder to people again, to not worry about the vocabulary and even botanists, even people who are deep loving, like into plants, total plant crazy people like me, the mad botanist, also get confused. And I wanted to just do a little demonstration of that really fast. Um, these are notes that I was taking when I was trying to teach about grasses a couple months ago. I had to take these notes because I was confused about how they worked. And while I was doing that, I learned about paleas and lemmas and glooms. And then guess what I learned about those? That all of those were words for graphs. So I decided to go on a little journey where I wrote down every single word that the botanists, crazy people that they are, use for bracts. There were a lot. And it was so much fun to know that it wasn't just me going crazy. It was just that there were just so many words and I hadn't put it together that they were all Brax. And yes, if you've seen my, if you've been in my class, you've heard my rant. So you can go watch that sometime. <laughs> um, and then I had to figure out leafed versus bract versus calyx. And then it was a whole like rabbit hole. It was so fun. And then um, also because I was trying to learn this stuff so I could teach better, I had to make myself a little diagram, age go two about all of the different kinds of flowers, the way that we have solitary, and then we have a head where it's a lot of flowers, and then the terms that Jack was telling us about, um, like having these, so that then you could see no, um, no petioles, some petioles, and then all of them, you know, just like how it kind of goes, and then compound things, and then, you know, pinnate leaves versus 
multipinnately compound leaves and all of this fun stuff. So if the vocab is challenging, there's a good reason. And the reason is that botanists are crazy. <laughs> I've been having fun um, at my restoration site um, doing this kind of thing, but also um, going back to some pages where I only got to do um, like some of the notes in the field and adding on to them. And the other day I got to work on one of my maps, which was really fun. Um, I was trying to figure out a good way to picture where all of the areas are that I work on. And so trying to draw a map from Google Maps, that was okay, but I wanted to be able to see my own data more easily because sometimes I can get confused with like all of the little lines with the roads. So trying to do a grayed out section where I get to look at all of the different um, areas that I actually work were kind of fun and then getting to name them. So this is the Vista. This was the bike path. This is priority one. And there had never, I'd never realized that we were restoring this area too, because I would walk past it and I would think, oh, you know, a few scraggly plants, but then a lot of ornamentals. And I was so wrong. And I discovered that last week when I was trying to go after the hemlock and the hemlock was impossible to get out because of the impacted ground. So I come up with a name for this. I now call this the wedge. <laughs> wow. So I'm, I'm happy that I now have a name and um, just, I don't know where I was going with all of this. I just love you all so much. And I love plants and I've just drunk coffee. So I'm just like really, really hyper and have a great day. And if anybody ever has like questions about plants, you know, write me, call me, hang out with me, something like that. Okay, thanks. Or, or pencil mile and chill with me. That too, that too. <laughs> um, so what, what they is saying here is, um, is so important. Um, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to get this and here we go. There we are. Um, so she knows botany and she gets confused by the, two, the terms too, right? You're not alone and it's okay. And so just like, you know, she on a regular basis, you know, you, you sketch note those little notes and things, we all do it. And then your brain remembers it a little bit better. And if you forget it, then you can look back at this or you can redo another one another time. But it's fun to have, I love how you got on your Bract project. <laughs> and um, the, uh, and, and, you know, in spite of, you know, doing that deep dive, look, she didn't end up gloomy. Pretty much it, it became a thing where I'd look at first the little glooms and I'd be like, here are bract. Then I'd see the palea, there are bract. And then the lemma, everywhere are bract, bract. And it's kind of like, oh, there's, there's a bract, everywhere are bract, bract. Yeah. We have to figure out the whole song with that. Yeah. Challenge so, for everybody. Um, all these grasses had some bracts, E-I-E-I, -E -I, bract. Oh. Um, oh, I forgot. Also, there was a question about one of your garden plants. First of all, the one, oh yes, gloomy. Um, the, did the um first of all are there prickles on that one and yes. also are those bug bites deep lobes or both uh, these are deep lobes and it's very prickly hmm. yep i see the little thornies cool <laughs> thank you that was fun thank you let's see what's up with jack it is good to see you Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, so I did a bunch of birds. I'm usually doing plants and and bugs, but I decided to do birds this past few days. So I did a, here's a turkey vulture. Oh, the end view, and you, uh, uh, you've observed the way that those, as it's coming you know, towards you or away from you, you really see those wing tips that the, 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 they just curl up and you get this that that neat fingering on the end there. Yeah. And this woodpecker, this um red-headed woodpecker. Oh wow. With those yeah, that beautiful stripy back. And those I also have great. Uh, and I, I also have you have that woodpecker species. I would, I wish I had that out here for me to sketch. It's a beautiful and bird. I and I have this robin I was following around, and he flew. He flew so close to me, I could have just reached out and touched him. We were able to get a let's see this. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe flatten the the book out so we can see both sides. There we are. This was Tuesday. 
Yep. Oh, this is fun. And look, so and everybody notice the um, sort of Jack is chaining together um, observations and questions. This is so annoying. That's really fun. Oh, 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 you got white. You got the 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 the, the white on the, the the tips of the tail and on the wing there. So that 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 white on nobody everybody thinks that the tail of those things is just all dark. But there's that little white out there. And there's also white on the wing. This is so cool. I like how you've done a little kind of just sort of the, the spot diagrams to tie in with the, the details that you're noticing. And also good metadata. We've got I've the, gotten to I've gotten to the toned paper on my book and the white colored pencil really shows up on that one. Isn't the toned paper fun? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I do on, on mine is I will I'll I'll start just sort of in with um, the well I'm gonna join you. Um, so I'll I'll start on the white paper. But then as I'm going along doing that, sometimes I'll say to myself like, oh, you know what? This would be a really good thing to do with toned paper. And so then I will jump over to the toned paper to do things there. So you can also, you don't have to go in order in this book. Um, so when you see something you're thinking like, I want to mess with my white pencil on that. Like, wouldn't it be fun to do like some of the white lines on the back of that woodpecker with my toned paper, right? Then you can jump over to the back of the book and, and put that in. And then uh, people will think that, well, but then how do you get, how do you get, you sort of, sort of know that then things are out of sequence, out of order. Um, that's why we have the metadata on the pages saying like what date this was. And so you can feel free to use those toned paper also and kind of mix them in with when you're doing other sorts of things. And uh, also a fun thing to do if you feel like it is that on the, the, the back of the book, there's that little kind of uh, table of contents. And you can put in the, um, the different sort of events that you're seeing and the dates. Um, that Robin study, really cool. Um, was, that, was that an in-flight um, one as well that you had? Uh, um, this one. Um, see. This one. Yeah. Because I, I noticed that they like, they like flap their wings and then they close them up and just like um, go down and then they flap them and go up and then they go down and close their wings back up and that's the, that's a bird, that's the Robin closing its wings. Oh, see, fantastic observation. And I really like, I got the feeling, that's what I was thinking. It looked like that bird sort of in the, in flight there. And uh, could you hold that up one more time for us? Um, and closer to the Robin page, so bring us in on that. Oh yeah, Clo that's right, closes them completely in flight. Yeah, people think that flying is this. Nope. And a lot of and a lot of hawks just glide and then when they and then when there's not as much thermal like updrafts, they just flap and then when they catch another one, they just glide. That's neat. It's and cool I, to see you, you busting into um, the the birds here. Was that was that fun to go that direction in your journal? Uh -huh. And uh, guess what I saw um, on the night of the eclipse clouds oh no there were clouds everywhere i couldn't see anything oh no i'm but, sorry but the exact ex the exact time the eclipse was supposed to start i recorded this in owl hooted oh oh tell us about that it was like ooh, 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 ooh. and i couldn't it was like really far off in the valley in our backyard, we have like um, at the edge of the yard, there's like a long fence and we have a huge horse valley. Like it's all horse pastures and stuff. And like down farther to the right, there was an owl hooting in a tree and I couldn't, I couldn't see it, but it was cool. That's really cool. 
I wonder if that was a great horn. Mm -hmm. That's that's really what a fun uh, discovery. And, and I had a, hmm? no, please. Um, I had a question. Do you know what this feather is? My brother found it in the woods. It's what? all black. I we think it's a um, turkey vulture feather because they're always back there. And then today. My dad found this in the, it's the biggest feather I've ever seen. He found it in the horse pasture. Oh. It's over a foot long. Wow. Here's a, uh, here's a um, foot ruler. Oh, look at that. Um. And it's the, it's the biggest feather I've ever seen. And it's got like, it's, mo it's all black. It's all like brownish black with the with like white white all over one side. Um, hold on, let me. I've, I've got an idea, and I want to show you a a resource. Um, and here's it in, compa in comparison to the other feather. Yeah. So. Um, because I do collect feathers, I have um. I have a, this is my collection. So um, there is a wonderful resource that I think that you'll be interested in here. I'm going to share screen. And this is um, the US Fish and Wildlife Services Forensic Laboratories Feather Atlas. Now, what is super cool here is that this is a um, this is a, a has examples of so it can identify your feather. You can identify all the feathers from all the birds you're going to find using this, and it is it's ridiculously. Cool. What I want to do is um, we're going to check out, um, uh, let's see, search. Um, let's check out immature um, bald eagle um, first. Um, common name, um, bald eagle. And These are the axillary feathers. Mine might look like one of those to the, yeah. all the way to the bottom right. Oh, now top right. Yeah, those, one of those. Check this out. So. Um, Mine looks like that um, one, three, two over from the, all the way to the right and then count two over the third one. That looks like mine. Yeah, it does. <laughs> So it's a tail feather. Right yeah. So in. Oh my gosh, that looks exactly like mine. Isn't that cool? That's like the exact thing. Oh my gosh. You've got a bald eagle, an immature bald eagle's tail feather. So the adults get these old white tail feathers, but the uh, the immature ones, the, the juveniles, mm -hmm. they have dark feathers hold that hold yours up again oh look at that look at that <laughs> so would that so would that mean it's a rare feather or what um are juveniles the ones that have like only their it's their first um first coat of feathers because yeah. i have i have this book my nana and papa gave me it has it shows the juvenile of the bird too. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. So the um, what they, they they start off with these sort of dark feathers. Whoops. Um, why am I going? I am. Now I can't get back to that page. Ah, uh, I'm going to type in feather. Mm. 
but but so this this resource um you so can you just so just search up feather atlas just type in feather atlas this bad boy pops up and you can the the easiest way to kind of go through it is this identify my feather feature that they have and my computer is being very slow so sorry about that um, and they're, they're going to ask you some questions about your feather and um, then they can help you narrow it down and uh, so you can do that from all sorts of feathers in your your collection it's a but like you see the bald eagle up in the sky, it's like, oh, look at that. Wow, it's a bald eagle up there. But you don't realize how big they actually are. Like this tail feather is over a foot long. It's, it's enormous. It's enormous. And, and I had one more page to share. Um, okay, I'm going to drop out of this share here and I'm going to turn off my screen. Let's see what else you've got going on. What? what well, are you going to do some journaling about your eagle feather? Probably now that I know it's a bald eagle feather. <laughs> but um I actually have two I actually have two pages. Um so I caught I caught this butterfly. I still don't know what type of butterfly it is, but ever since since I was really little, we went for my first fishing trip, we like made it a whole thing. We went fishing at this place called Deer Creek, um in Maryland. And um my grandpa saw this butterfly and he was like, oh, let's name it Bob the Butterfly. So that's really the only name we've known for this butterfly since. But I still don't know what type of butterfly it is. But um, for Easter, we got a, I got a butterfly net and a um, little like cage type of thing. It's not a wire cage. It's actually like a um, fabric-y see-through, like it has holes in it, the cage for butterflies. I can't really explain it, but um, we caught him and put him in that, and he stayed real still for me, so I could draw him, and then um, I let him go. Oh, Bob is spectacular. Um, that's really cool. And that with that that one bold dark spot in the wing. Um, I think you see a little bit of dark at the tip of the wing, and then there's a bold dark spot on the wing. Um, I'm going to hold. Uh, I'm going to bring out a book of uh, butterflies for you here. There's a group of butterflies which are collectively called, appropriately enough, they're called whites. And the whites include all these white butterflies. And so I'm going to show you some of the whites. Um, I'm going to just grab this book off my shelf and I'll be right back, okay? Okay. Um, I couldn't find the book that I, I wanted to find, but I found another really useful one. Um, but this one is sort of a focus on, on Western. Um, but this is Butterflies Through Binoculars. Um, and um, so that's a, um, a really useful one because it's, they're not assuming that you have a dead butterfly in your hand. And um, let me jump to the whites. There we go. And I am going to share screen. There's the chaos from our class here. Um, but these are these are whites. I have a and suggestion. I I think. This probably this might be wrong probably, but I think the what this butterfly that I drew the bold black um, dot is on both wings, and if it folds its wings, if it's closed up and then it unfolds the wings like this, if it's like on a tree or on something, um, to a predator the two dots that are now two instead of one, look like might look like eyes to scare them away to make it look like a bigger creature or something. 
That's cool. So yours I, know, is... I know, I know bigger butterflies have that. Mm -hmm. So it, this is, is reminding you of some of those eye spots that we, we see on, on, on bigger butterflies. One very common uh, one of an abundant white is, um, so this is, so listen to this, this is, uh, it's a European species introduced into Canada in the 19th century is now perhaps the most ubiquitous butterfly in North America is the cabbage white. So yours, as if you hold it up, the, you've got these nice dark spots you showed on the wing, and then you showed a kind of a paler gray in the tip of the wing out there. And I'm seeing both of those. My guess is that what we're looking at is uh, cabbage white but yeah, because we we see those butterflies like multiple multiple of them all the time all the time in our yard in spring to summer um late spring to early summer time all right let's see uh what they say here about um time of year I don't see anything that is saying about time of year. Um, I, I I love that uh, you've got your your family has a special name for this uh, this butterfly. Um, I think it may be our the cabbage white, um, but uh, I would say don't lose that family name of Bob for it. <laughs> That's and really one, one more thing to share. Um, we do, I for, I don't know what exact time of year, but it's in the summertime. We do um, plant milkweed and we have, we like um, go through the whole cycle, not whole cycle, but of monarch butterflies. Like we, um, um, like last year there were, it was a bit, there was a big storm and they, all the caterpillars were on the milkweed. So we took them in and put them in our um, screen and porch and in, That's in, great. The, in the cage I um, told about earlier, and we we watched them go from caterpillar, well, basically egg to caterpillar to um, monarch butterfly, well, to chrysalis to monarch butterfly, and then we release them and they um, head to Mexico. Oh man, if if you folks do that again this year, wouldn't it be fun to document that whole process in your journal? Yeah, we are doing it this year. Oh, you are. That's great. Uh -huh. Um, that's a terrific thing to do. Thank you for taking care of those butterflies. Um, you know, butterflies need, um, just like vultures, is taking care of the birds uh, of, of the area. Butterflies also need our support, planting, um, uh, planting species that are useful for them at different times of their, their life cycles. Um, over here on the West Coast, our wintering population of of monarch butterflies has completely crashed and will probably go extinct uh, or be extirpated in our lifetime. Um, and uh, there are other populations of monarchs that are, are doing well, but there is something going on. The, the planet is telling us on all sorts of levels that we are in, there's something wrong going on. And for people like you and me, to um, sort of take on the, 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 the mantle of stewardship for our butterflies is um, that's, we're, we're thinking in the right way. So just the way that Avea takes care of the plants in her area, Valters is looking after the birds. If as nature journalers, we think our, of ourselves as stewards of, of nature nearby, there's a lot that we can do to protect and, and help these things. That's out, out here on the west coast of the United States. Um, there, there was a place, uh, Pacific Grove, where you could go into this one little canyon, and in winter time, just the 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 branches are dripping with these huge clusters of monarchs, all kind of cuddled up together on a cold morning. And now, there's a couple of butterflies there. Um, and so. Uh, doing things like you're doing to take care of your local butterflies. Um, I really respect that. So thank you, Jack. And um, one more last thing. 
I can't, I'm getting really excited. It's in July um, that we're doing it. Um, well, last year, actually, no, two or three years, I don't know which, we went to California for vacation and um, whatever, two, three years ago, I wasn't in a nature journaling at all. So I probably wasn't looking around as much for birds and uh, other things, but we, we were staying with our cousins. They had like a guest house um, for guests and stuff. So we were hanging out with them in California, but this year we're going to Yellowstone National Park for vacation. Yeah. And, I, and we're gonna, um, we're, we're gonna go hiking almost every day and I can't wait. Oh, that's gonna be fantastic. And you're bringing your journal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, there's there's such great um, journaling opportunities there. I mean, that, you know, out, out here, you know, like we're like, oh, my gosh, there's a deer. There will be like, OK, you see the deer. Now look just past them. So the second herd of elk by the bison out there, just beyond there, that's where the grizzly bear is. So there's like it, the place is just dripping with megafauna. That's going to be really fun. So yep. hey, before you go, um, before you go, let me know a few weeks before you go. We'll do, a, um, we'll, we'll schedule some, uh, let, actually, let me get on the calendar when you are going and I'll set up some uh, nature journaling workshops specifically about drawing large North American mammals. I do, I do know the exact date of our departure. It is our- uh, actually, wait, wait, hold on. Um, send that to me because if there are any burglars who are watching the Nature Journaling show, we don't want you to know when you don't know where Jack lives, but we don't even want you to know when he's going to be gone. Right. So um, shoot me an email with those dates and we'll make some Nature Journaling workshops specifically about drawing large mammals that live in Yellowstone. And um, then you go there and you just sketch up a uh, journal up a storm. That is going to be so cool. I'm probably going to fill like a whole journal full of um I, I would not be surprised. Oh, okay, here's here's my challenge for you. If you fill up a whole journal there, right? I will give you a new blank journal from my store. If you fill up an entire journal on your visit to to Yellowstone. Um I will give you um, I'll, I'll let the, uh, my store manager know, and we'll we will we'll mail you a a, a brand new um, journal um, on us. Thank you. Don't have to worry about running out of paper. But um, yeah, let, yeah. let me know when. Uh, I would love to see that. Oh, I can't believe you found an eagle feather. That's so cool. That's really really cool. <laughs> That's a lot of feather. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thanks. Absolutely. So I am now going to jump over to um, our the community cam here again. Is there anybody else that wants to share something in their journal? Um, it, do you have a? Uh, it can be something that you want to share from your journal or any um, thoughts, comments, or ideas for the community that you wanted to, to, to reach out and share with us. Okay, well, so what I'm about to do is I'm going to turn off the recording and then people who would like to participate but don't feel comfortable being on screen, um, you'll be able to share with us. For everybody that is here, um, and uh, joining us and people who will be watching this online uh, um, in the recording. Thank you so much, and I hope that you got some useful strategies here and some inspiration from looking through the notebooks and journals of our other friends. Thank you all so much. <laughs>